Okay, um, our outline for the class, of course, this is the fourth week of our eight-week class. We are dealing with the last two of the major prophets today, that is Ezekiel and Daniel. Next week we will begin the Book of the Twelve, which we Christians know as the Minor Prophets. In the Hebrew Bible, all twelve of the Minor Prophets are lumped together in one book, called the Book of the Twelve. So we will start that next week, we'll do an introduction to it, and then begin with Hosea, Joel, and Amos. As I actually get into the study, I may divide how many of the prophets, the minor prophets, we deal with each week based upon uh, how much content I feel we want to cover in those. But today we will finish the last of the major prophets. We'll talk about the fact that Daniel, who we're going to talk about and discuss today, is not considered a prophetic book in the uh, Hebrew Bible, that is the Jewish, the Jewish Bible, what we call the Old Testament. But it is typically listed as one of the prophetic books and the last of the four major prophets in the Christian Bible because we break things up differently. Okay? Um, we've looked at this chart before. Previously, we've, we've looked at Isaiah and Jeremiah. Today, we're going to talk about Ezekiel and Daniel. We'll look at this again when we get to Daniel. The book of Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel was speaking to and writing to Jews who were captive in Babylon. <clears throat> Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, you'll notice that the time periods on these overlap. All three of these uh, prophets <coughs> excuse me, um, were speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, Israel was broken into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. So it's been gone for over 100 years by the time we get to where we are now. Um, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, all three are addressing either Judah as, it is, uh, as they are approaching the destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, or, as is in the case of um, Ezekiel and Daniel, speaking to the Israelites who are in exile in Babylon. Ezekiel actually starts out before Jerusalem is destroyed, and then, um, right in the middle of the book, we have, a we have the statement that a man has come to Jerusalem to say that the city has fallen. So we're going to be talking about those three today, um, particularly Ezekiel to start with. The, he's speaking to the whole house of Israel. Now, uh, we're talking about just the southern kingdom of Judah, but these prophets, because a lot of what they're talking about is a, a prophetic, a future or predictive prophecy about the eventual restoration of Israel, quite often when they're talking about the restoration, they're not just talking about the nation of Judah, which still exists at this point, they're including the nation of Israel, which was completely destroyed. And again, as we've talked about before, the northern kingdom of Israel had the ten tribes. There were two tribes in the south, ten in the north. Those are what's known as the lost tribes of Israel. Because the Assyrians, when they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, they took the people off into captivity. They brought other captive people into that area of Samaria. Um, they forced them to intermarry. They, and so you ended up losing, in effect, all of those people. The southern kingdom of Judah, the two tribes there, they were taken into captivity in Babylon, but then were allowed to come back and so, in, in fairly short order. In fact, it was only about 50 or 60 years later that they actually returned or could return. So that's where we get the lost tribes of Israel. But much of what Ezekiel, and uh, you'll notice that Jeremiah was focusing much more just on the southern kingdom of Judah. Ezekiel <coughs> opens that up because he has more of a focus on the eventual restoration. So he talks about Israel more. And then Daniel, again, talks long-term prophetic about Israel as well as both of these, <coughs> actually getting into the Gentile nations. <coughs> I'm sorry about my my vocal fry, my cough today, I, I'm not clear here. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, all three have areas where they have prophetic oracles against the nations, not just about Israel or Judah, <coughs> but also about all of the other surrounding nations. We will look at that. Um, okay, let's, this is a, oops, this is another chart you've seen. We're looking at Daniel and Ezekiel, and you'll notice they're right here in this gap where Judah has ended the nation of Judah. Jerusalem has not yet been destroyed when Ezekiel starts, but this is the time period. So Babylon has arisen, Assyria um, has, has declined and is actually completely destroyed in 612. 
But this is the time period we're talking about with Daniel and Ezekiel here, okay? Or Ezekiel and Daniel, we'll put them in, in order. Let's talk about Ezekiel. I've had a couple of people tell me this week that they've always been afraid to read Ezekiel uh, because it's a little strange and a little scary in places. Um, <coughs> this is um, just an image, an icon image of Ezekiel. We don't know what he really looked like. This is a painting that's a representation um, of one of Ezekiel's first visions. In fact, the first vision of Ezekiel in the first chapter where he sees the glory of God. Um, this is a very sort of sensible one. It's, it's, I'm sorry it's hard to see, but you, there are four, um, there are animals down here. He sees a vision. We'll look at, this, at the passage. Um, where the glory of God is moving, there are wings and there are eyes and there are you know, representations of animals. It's kind of strange. This is one of the more... Uh, reasonable or reasoned versions of it. If you go online and you look up visions of Ezekiel, you'll get all sorts of really weird things because the, the description in the first chapter of Ezekiel of his first vision of the glory of God has such wheels within wheels. You've heard the expression a wheel within a wheel? That's Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel has been a very popular amongst UFO theorists that this was, a, this was an unidentified alien encounter. And that Ezekiel is describing something that is a spaceship. Okay, I don't, I don't particularly hold to that. <laughs> by the way. Uh, but you do need to understand that the description that we'll look at is is quite strange. And this is just one artist's representation. In fact, if you put six or eight of these different artistic representations of the vision of Ezekiel down next to each other, it'd be very hard to tell that they're all supposed to be referring to the same thing. Because there's so many details, wheels within wheels, and the wheels all have eyes and animals, and they have each has, uh, or the beings each have four faces, and they have four wings, and the wings are touching each other, and they're moving in every direction, and they have feet like cows, and and you know it's it's very complicated stuff. Okay, um, the book of Ezekiel again, the author Ezekiel, the prophet. Uh, not a lot of question about that. <coughs> The time period is between about five, um, 593 to 571 BC. This is right over the time period in which Jerusalem, uh, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, which is in 586. We'll get to that. It, it takes place, um, it's written to rather, it doesn't take place, it's written to the people of Judah and the city of Jerusalem during the Babylonian exile. Now, Ezekiel himself is not in Jerusalem. He's in exile in Babylon. I'll show you a map. So the theme is the exile um, of the people of Judah, the Jewish people, is a, is a sign of God's judgment, but that with their righteousness will come restoration. And there's some very particular theological themes there. The purpose is to call the generation that was born during the Babylonian exile to seek the Lord in order to be restored. Remember, he's actually speaking to uh, people in exile. Although he has visions in which God picks him up and takes him to Jerusalem and lets him see what's happening there, he is actually in exile and he is speaking to the people in exile. His call to be a prophet did not occur until after he went into exile with the, with the Israelites. Um, there's several ways you could slice this. Probably the best outline is the call of Ezekiel and chapter 1 is uh, kind of a self-standing unit. Then the judgment against Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Chapters 2 through 24. Then there are the oracles again against the nations, that is, other nations that surround Judah and Israel. Um, chapters 25 to 32. And then finally, a long section, uh, 16 chapters actually, on the restoration of Israel. And a vision of God uh, explains why God will restore Israel. It's not because they're any good, but because he's doing it for the glory of his own name. And he explains all of that. He talks about calling the people back from exile, and we've talked before about the fact that the, the Jewish ideal of salvation, the Jewish definition of salvation, is to be brought back from exile. And there's a lot of that content in the prophetic writings, and Ezekiel probably more than any other. And so the restoration of Israel is huge. The last um, eight chapters deal with a vision of the new temple, which is three times larger than the temple that we've known has ever been. And so a, a future prophetic vision of what the temple of God will be like when it is restored. Lynn? Is the message for second and third generation 
for more generations. Well, the, the, there's two... The, I'm just sort of confused. Well, there's two things there. Uh, Ezekiel was speaking to the people who were alive when he was alive. Right, but are those people's second and third generation? Or uh, well, they're the first. They were the people who came in, out at, who, who were exiled with him, exiles. and their their children. So there's not a multiple generation. Right. But okay. we believe, and uh, even the Jewish people believe, that the writings of Ezekiel, like most of the prophetic writings, have have a twofold purpose. They were written for the people who were alive then and the situation alive then. But then there's also an interpretation of all these things for the future. We get to Daniel, especially. You know, Daniel has visions that clearly uh, are talking about the future, and some of the some of the things in Daniel where he gives specific descriptions of things, we it is it's very hard not to see how those things line up with things that happened long after Daniel's death. But in this case, we believe Ezekiel is writing to the people alive when he was alive. That is, the people who came out of Israel and exiled to Babylon and their children. But that, especially because the last sections of Ezekiel have to do with the prophetic vision of the future, it's clearly for people down the road, you know, because this is all going to happen long after those people are gone. All right? Now, to give you a visual perspective, this is the Babylonian Empire. We've looked at this map before. The Babylonian Empire is this darkened area here. Babylon had conquered, or the Babylonians had conquered, all of the Middle East, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Syria, part of Asia Minor, which we know as Turkey, um, pretty much all of Iraq, much of it, what we know as Iran, and they had conquered the parts of Egypt that anybody would want, that is along the Nile River. Um, the, this is Jerusalem. This area right here would have been the nation of Israel at its height. It came down here into the Sinai Peninsula. And so this would have been Israel. This is Jerusalem. This is Babylon. That's a long way, folks. Um, to give you an idea, this is Greece over here. This Asia Minor, it was called, was what is what we know of as Turkey. So from Jerusalem to Babylon was a very very long distance. That's how far away Ezekiel is when he's writing it. That's how far away the the exiles the uh, from Judah were when they were hearing his uh, his prophetic statements. Yes. Where's Phoenicia? I was reading that Daniel. Phoenicia, it, and I'll actually give you a map uh, as we go along. Phoenicia is along the coast right here. The Phoenicians were famous sailors, and so they were uh, along the, right along the coast. Um, the, well, actually, the, the southern coast where I just pointed is Philistine. North is Phoenicia. Tyre and Sidon, for instance, are Phoenician cities. Uh, the Philistines, which were also a coastal people right down here, it is from the Philistines that we get the name Palestine which was a common name for them because the Philistines were, you know, one of the peoples there. I don't know how they decided to call it Palestine from the Philistines instead of calling it Phoenicia from the Phoenicians or something else, but, but they did. <laughs> they didn't call me. That was done a long time ago. <coughs> All right, so that gives you a perspective of just, and, and to think about being taken away in captivity. Think about the fact that the Israelites believed that the land was what, a critical part of their relationship with God. God's promise to them was that you will be my people, I will be your God, I will be in your midst, and I will make you a great people, and I will give you a land where you will live. That was the promise from Abraham on. I will give you a land for yourself. Well, now the land has been taken away. The temple during Ezekiel's life is destroyed, the temple where the presence of God would be. It looks like everything is being pulled apart. And so to have... To have left the land that God gave the Israelites and to be this far away is devastating. It challenges everything they thought they knew about being a people and about being the people of God, etc., etc. Okay? This chart might help give you a perspective, and a, a particular thing I want to make clear here. We talked about Lamentations um, last week. This is Daniel. Now, Daniel's writing covers pretty much his whole life, from being a very young man until he's very old. It covers not just the, uh, the time of Babylon, but also Daniel was present in the, the Persian Empire, after the Persians defeated Babylon. The Daniel and the lion's den that we're going to look at, the lion's den was, in, was a Persian thing. That was after the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. So, but the three things I want you to see, in 605, Nebuchadnezzar... The king of, Babel, of the Babylonians first defeated Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah. So 605. 
But he didn't destroy the city. He just, in fact, they surrendered to him and said, you know, great and mighty king, because he had an army they couldn't stand up against. They were a small people. The Babylonians were the most powerful army that had ever come along. They had defeated the Assyrians pretty handily. Well, so the, after 605, the Israelites, or rather the Judahites, Israelites means it is a generic word, but um, Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah are um, controlled by and run by the Babylonians. And that's all fine, but the other great power, as I talked about before, was Egypt. <coughs> And so every time something good would happen for Egypt or sort of questionable with Babylonian, with the Babylonians, everybody the Babylonians controlled, including the kingdom of Judah, would say, hey, maybe the Egyptians are, are going to win now, let's side with them. And, and then the Egyptians would get beat in a battle, and they'd go, oh, no, 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 we're with the Babylonians. And there even were factions in Jerusalem that supported one or the other side. And it was a game of ping pong back and forth. Well, what happened was, every time one of the kings of Judah decided that they thought the Babylonians were getting weak and that Egyptians, they were going to put their money on the Egyptians, then Nebuchadnezzar would march back over there and kick their backside and straighten them up. Okay? So in 605 is the, first time, is the first defeat of the kingdom of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar takes a group of, uh, of the people of Judah, the Jews, off into exile, into deportation. Amongst that first group was Daniel, of Daniel, the book of Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, then, again, they were underneath the Babylonians, then they, they kept going back and forth. In 597, so eight years later, they had been trying to side with the Egyptians, so Nebuchadnezzar marches back over there with his army, and he, he straightens them out again. That is the second deportation, where he takes another large group of people, and he takes them off into captivity in Babylon. That was where Ezekiel left. So Daniel was part of the deportation in, in 605. Ezekiel was part of the deportation in 597. Now, the city is still standing. Jerusalem is still standing. Um, they haven't destroyed it. They just control it. But then they get so uppity and so, create so much problems, Nebuchadnezzar has had enough. So in 586, actually 588, he marches over and, and they, they close the city to him and he lays siege to it. And two years later, in 586, he conquers the city, he destroys the city of Jerusalem, he destroys the temple of God, and that's the third deportation where the last group of, of the people of Judah are taken off into captivity. So this whole process actually took 19 years and three different processes of deportation. Okay, yes? Did everyone just walk to Babylon? Well, they would have. I mean, they basically they basically were slaves at that point. Okay. And so, you know, it would be a caravan of slaves being taken off into captivity. Now, the Babylonians were pretty rough. I mean, they when they destroyed the city, you know, they killed the majority of the people in it uh, this third time. Prior to that, and it got worse each time, you know, as, as Nebuchadnezzar became more convinced that these people were not going to toe the line. Um, and so they were pretty rough, but a slave was a valuable thing. And so they did not perceive, you know, they, they, when they took them off into Babylon, they actually were given an area, which we're going to read in Ezekiel in just a second, they were given an area to live as a community. Um, and you've heard, by the rivers of Babylon, we, you know, we wept, we hung our harps, and the whole thing. There are, there's a sense in which that community lived there, and they, they were grieving the fact they were no longer in Jerusalem, they were no longer in the Promised Land, but they were not particularly oppressed, apparently, when they were in exile, okay? They had some freedom. They were their own community. They still had elders who were responsible for the community, things like that. So it's not like they were chained in a basement somewhere, okay? Very different kind of picture than you might imagine. And then you'll notice 70 years between inaugural and... There's a talk about the 70 years before the Restoration. Now, you can either count that from the first time that Judah was, was conquered, to the return to the land under King Cyrus of the Persians. When Cyrus the Persians defeated the Babylonians, he said he had a very different strategy. Everybody that was part of the Persian Empire, that, he had, that was a conquered people, he said, you can go back home. You can practice your own religion. As long as you don't rebel against me, as long as you pay your taxes, I'm going to let you do what you want. So the 70 years, that's biblical prophecy, is either between 605 and 538, or it's between the destruction of the temple and the restoration of the temple when it was rebuilt under 
Ezra, Zerubbabel, and then Nehemiah comes along and builds the wall. So either, we're not sure which of those references are, but either one of those is 70 years, plus or minus the, the first year, the, the inaugural year when it started all that. Yes? Do we know if uh, any of these three dates we, is when the Ark of the Covenant was lost? Well, it was when, uh, when Israel and the temple were destroyed that the Ark is gone. <coughs> now, as we'll see in Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar carried all of the implements from the temple off when he destroyed the temple. And his grandson, actually, it says the king, uh, and he refers to, to Nebuchadnezzar as his father, but that means, you know, the, who came before me. He's actually his grandson. He's having a big feast with his, his, all of his friends and their wives and concubines, and he calls for all of the implements from the temple in Jerusalem to come so that they can eat off of them and drink out of the cups and all that. Just this sort of way of saying, aren't we great? You know, these, these were supposed to be dedicated to that God over there. And that's where we get the handwriting on the wall. And, and the destruction of Babylon follows that immediately. Okay, now, the point is, anything that was made out of gold or silver or valuable jewels or anything else would have been taken off. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was covered in gold. The whole thing was covered in gold. So there's no way they would have missed that. We don't have any specific record of what happened, whether it was taken out before <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar took over the temple, um, or whether he, that was part of what he carried off. There's no reference to it. And there are half a dozen different stories. The Ethiopians claim that it is, um, it, it's hidden locked up in a, in a church, an ancient church in um, Ethiopia. Nobody's ever allowed to go in there. No one's ever seen it. But they say they have the Ark of the Covenant there. Well, and they keep guards 24 hours a day protecting this place. So who knows? We don't know about it. We don't have any details. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's actually start looking at the text. What I'm going to do is walk through a number of the different passages in the text and then talk about other um, chapters quickly as we go through here. The first chapter of Ezekiel is his vision of the glory of God. Let me read it. In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, 30th year means he's 30 years old. Okay, it doesn't mean his 30th year of captivity or whatever. He's 30 years old. In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The Kibar River was a, um, a canal that had been built that ran southeast out of Babylon. So this is the community of Israelites very, very close to the city of Babylon, in the, which you saw on the map. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, and they did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had a face like a human being, and on the right side, each had a face like a lion, and on the left, of the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spread out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning, as they went. Okay, this goes on at considerable more length than that. Um, it's strange. Okay, uh, as I say, so many different paintings and illustrations have been done of this. It's kind of a fascinating study, but the point is, um, Ezekiel, like so often happens in Scripture, is trying to describe a vision. You'll notice how often it says, and, it, and they were like, it was like, because he's seeing something he can't, actually, he can't fully describe, and so he's giving us the best description he can by telling you the closest thing that he can think of that it looked like. Um, Again, it is the presence of God's glory and God's holiness, we're told. The four creatures, later on in chapter 10, we're to, they're identified as being cherubim. There are several different classes of angels. There are seraphim, the, the uh, creatures of light, of fire. Uh, the cherubim, now these are not cherubs like little fat, you know, valentine guys with little, little bows and arrows. The cherubim were fearsome creatures, apparently. 
Uh, and again, you'll notice whenever an angel appears to anybody in Scripture, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid, fear not, because these, these were not comforting sights usually. It was scary stuff. So here we are. It's 592 B.C. Again, this is uh, six years before the actual destruction of Jerusalem, but it's well after Babylon, the Babylonians having conquered the southern kingdom. Ezekiel is near Babylon, living with the other exiles, and God shows Ezekiel his presence in that place. And a key part of this message is God is, in preparation for what's to come, God is saying to Ezekiel, I want you to see my presence and my glory here in Babylon, where you are, so that you know I am not limited to one place. A lot of the Israelites had started thinking because God had promised that his presence would be above the Ark of the Covenant, at the mercy seat, that that's the location, so to speak, of God's throne on earth. A lot of Israelites had assumed that that's where God lived and not really anywhere else, even though he was powerful. And so God is making a point to Ezekiel that he is not limited to just being in Jerusalem, in the temple, above the Ark of the Covenant, but he can be here too. Um, it's interesting, and, and the reason is because later on, he's going to leave, his presence is going to leave the temple, um, as, a, as a, a declaration of protest against the sins of the Israelites. It's interesting that he describes these creatures as having the four faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Later on, those four symbols, a man, a lion, ox, and eagle, would become the four symbols of the four evangelists. Matthew, at the faith, you know, is presented as a man. Um, Mark as a lion, Luke as an ox, and John the evangelist as an eagle. And uh, we talked about that when we did the, the, the evangelists in previous study. So you get, and this is where that idea comes from, okay? This astonishing vision that is given to Ezekiel. We continue <coughs> into the second chapter with Ezekiel's commission. Now, Ezekiel's commission is interesting in several ways. One, um, God frequently refers to Ezekiel as the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man, of course, was Jesus. Most fav it was his favorite reference for himself. Jesus called himself the Son of Man more than anything else. When we get to Daniel 7, you're going to see why the Son of Man. In this case, the Son of Man is you literally, I mean, the translation literally is the Son of Adam, which it's interesting. If, you, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia or seen the Narnia movies, uh, Aslan, the great lion, who represents Jesus, refers to the children as being the sons and daughters of Adam. Well, God refers to Ezekiel as the son of Adam, which we get translated as the son of man. It, it's a, a reference to the fact that God is acknowledging his humanity, his frailty, his, his, the fact that he's limited in what he can do, and God uses that title as a way of saying, but I am going to prepare you, even though you by yourself may be frail and only human, I am going to prepare you for this. Um, and so it reads, he said, he being God, said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is something you will see over and over and over again. Two expressions, which Ezekiel uses dozens of times each, is... This is what the Sovereign Lord says. So there's no question about where this is coming from. And <clears throat> references to the fact that then they will know that I am the Lord, or that I am the Lord God. All of this stuff is a witness, a testimony, to the, the power and sovereignty of God. And those two expressions occur over and over again. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid, three times he said that now, of what they will say or be terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. You will speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like, the, like that rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. 
And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Ezekiel then states that he's surprised that the scroll tastes sweet like honey. And the imagery here is that these are the words of God, his words of judgment and of woe written on this scroll. So many words, it has to be written on both sides, we're told, which you didn't usually do uh, to write on both sides of the scroll. Ezekiel eats it so that the words of God will be in him so that he then can speak to the people of Judah the very words of God that he has consumed. All right? um, Isaiah, like Jeremiah before Ezekiel, all three of them are warned by God that the people are rebellious and they probably won't listen. But in every case, God's message is, but don't be afraid because I'm with you. You're speaking for me. And so it's not just up to you. Okay? Any questions about any of that? You all know that you stop me and ask questions if you have anything as we go along. So this is the commission of Ezekiel. God shows him his glory. God then commissions him and gives him his words to speak to the people of Judah. And then God begins to give Ezekiel instructions to do some very strange things. Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, is sort of the prophet of theater. Because Ezekiel is given any number of symbolic things to do which represent some aspect of God's will, God's plan. Um, there are first four symbolic acts that come in chapters 4 and 5. Let me read this. Now, son of man, take a, <clears throat> excuse me, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face towards it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. Then the second sign. Then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you finish this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. Here he's differentiating between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face towards the siege of Jerusalem, and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. Very theatrical. All of it intended as, as uh, images, very visual kinds of symbols of God's message. The first of these is the, the build a clay model, basically, of uh, Jerusalem, and then lay siege to it as a sort of puppet show, is a symbol of the fact that the city of Jerusalem would come under siege. Now, this is what happened in 80, 588. This happens later. Again, early on, when Nebuchadnezzar showed up, the kings gave up because they knew they didn't, they didn't stand a chance against him. And so, the, the city hasn't actually been besieged. Now, the prophecy is that the city of Jerusalem will come under siege. There were false prophets who were saying, oh, no, 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 the Babylonians aren't going to bother us anymore. The Babylonians are too weak now. Egypt is the guy to follow. Oh, no, the city will never come under siege. Oh, well, if it comes under siege, it will only last a short time. And on and on. There were false prophecies. God is using this to, to have a, a clear message from Ezekiel to say the city will come under siege. Now, the, two, the next image or symbol is when Ezekiel sold the first ride his life, lie on his right side for 390 days. I'm sure he got to get up and go to the bathroom and stuff, but generally, you know, probably when he was outside in public in front of people and tied with ropes. And then after that period of time, 390 days, lie on his left side for 40 days. 390 days representing the sin of Israel in the north, 40 days representing the sin of Judah in the south. It's believed that those particular numbers is that it was 390 years from the time when Solomon, King David's son, Solomon is the one who really introduced pagan worship. Because his wives, he married Canaanite, foreign wives, they worshiped foreign gods. Solomon allowed them to, and in fact even built high places, temples, places of worship to pagan gods. 
Solomon even allowed them to institute child sacrifice to some of these gods. Between that time and the fall of Jerusalem was 390 years. Then the 40 days, which represents 40 years, is believed to be the reign of Manasseh, which was the worst of the southern kings. Manasseh uh, was a southern king of Judah, and while there were some good kings of Judah, Hezekiah was a good king, uh, Josiah was a good king, one of Josiah's sons was a good king, Manasseh, in between, um, was a terrible king, and he, he ruled for 40 years. So they believe that's the thing that really called for the destruction of the southern kingdom of Israel, of uh, Judah and Jerusalem. All right? Those four symbolic acts continue. These are the first two. The third one, take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You guys ever eaten Ezekiel bread? There's a bread, a commercial bread called Ezekiel bread that's made out of these materials. Wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt. I saw it over at Super Lake once. It is still there. It's still there. In the okay. Section. So it's it's and some of these, for instance, spelt is a very is a very ancient uh, which was almost lost and it's been sort of rediscovered and re-established. But um, this bread that he's supposed to make, you can actually purchase Ezekiel bread now. And they get they have the they have this passage, you know, from Ezekiel 4 on the wrapper. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> um, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also measure out a sixth of a hen of water and drink it um, at set times. Eat the food as you would eat as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said, in this way the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Then I said, this is Ezekiel, not so, sovereign Lord. I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well, he said, this is God. I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. Now, in case you don't know, Human excrement was considered, you know, to use it for fuel or anything, defiled, anything around it. But cow dung, to, even today, is frequently used as a fuel. Uh, they burn it because it's got dried grass and all kinds of stuff in it. Uh, it, it doesn't have an odor. It burns cleanly. Around the world, to, even today, they use cow dung for all sorts of things. They make houses of it. They hammer it to make smooth floors in their houses. And it's a primary fuel. So that was quite common. The idea of using human excrement from this was not common and was considered a defiling thing. All right? Now, son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Then take a set of scales and divide up the hair. When the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Assuming, we assume he means inside the model he's got. Take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city and scatter a third to the wind. For I will pursue them with drawn sword, and take a few hairs, and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Again, take a few of these, and throw them into the fire, and burn them up. A fire will spread from there to all Israel. Okay? So, the third of these four uh, symbolic acts is the making of bread and burn, you know, cooking it over excrement. <laughs> the... The idea there is the people are going to be driven, who are going to survive, are driven into exile and eat defiled foods. The, one, the first chapter of the book of Daniel involves several things, but one of the, one of the points in there is that Daniel and his friends who are, who are Jews uh, work out a deal where they don't have to eat the king's food. Well, the reason they don't want to eat the king's food is not, not only that it wasn't kosher, you know, it didn't follow Jewish law, but in all likelihood in Babylon, any food that they got at the king's table would have first been offered to the idols, would have been offered to the Babylonian gods. And so that's the reason that they didn't want to eat it. But that's a symbol of the fact, that's, or a, that, that echoes the fact that when they were driven off into captivity and exile, the Jews would be forced to eat food that was defiling to them. And that's what that symbol is. And then the last symbol, shave your head, cut off your beard, take the, the hair, burn a third of it in the model city, to indicate the fact that the city will burn and a third of the people will die in those fires. Take your sword and cut some of the hair with your sword around the outside of the city, meaning a third of those who escape will be killed by the sword when they try to escape. 
and then scatter to the wind a third of the others. Those are the ones that will be driven away into exile or to be lost. But you'll notice, take a few hairs and tuck them in your garments. This is the remnant that is to be saved. Remnant, the idea of a remnant theology, we talked about that before. A remnant is a small portion. Throughout the Old Testament, even in times of greatest judgment, this is true in Jeremiah, it is true here, there, are, there always is a promise from God that not everyone will be judged, not everyone will be destroyed, it will remain a small number of people from whom the truth of God and the glory of God will be shown as they grow back into the people of God. Okay? And so that few hairs tucked away in the folds of the garment represent the remnant that is to be saved. Then... God describes what all this stuff means. I just told you, but you know, we'll, we'll read what he had to say. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem. All of these things represent Jerusalem, which I have set at the center of the nations, the holy city of God, the place where God's presence, he describes it as saying it's the center of the nations, with countries all around her. Yet in her wickedness she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than, any more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws, has not followed my decrees. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Remember that? There it comes again. All re repeated over and over and over, and it gets more frequent as you go along. What the Sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you, and have not followed my decrees or kept my laws. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. There it is again. I myself am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations. Because of all your detestable idols, I will do what, uh, what I have never done before and will never do again. Therefore, in your midst, parents will eat their children and children will eat their parents. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all of your survivors to the winds. Cannibalism was predicted would occur during the siege, a two-year siege, where nothing was allowed in or out of the city of Jerusalem, actually almost three years. Um, and as people died, other people ate them. And that's what Ezekiel is prophesying from God here. Children will eat their parents, parents will eat their children. Okay? He goes on. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defied my, defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, and he's going to get to details about that later, I myself will shave you, which was considered uh, a shaming in that day. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. Then my anger will cease, and my wrath against them will subside, and I will be avenged. There are various places where you get just little glimpses. And then at the end, the last third almost, of um, Ezekiel is all about restoration. Um, and when I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. They will know that I, the Lord. That's the other thing that gets repeated often. I will make you a ruin and a repro reproach among the nations around you. In the sight of all who pass by, you will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and an object of horror to the nations around you when I inflict punishment on you in anger and in wrath and with stinging rebuke. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you, and they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed I will sweep through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Whew. Laura? Um, going back to cooking, this is all powerful. Yeah. And it relates. It's just that, you know, he's he's so adamant in how things will happen. Why did he allow Ezekiel to, to change the cooking from... From human to cattle. Well, because that actually would have defiled Ezekiel, and Ezekiel hasn't done anything wrong. Okay. And so when Ezekiel protests and say, wait a minute, that's going to defile me, and I'm supposed to be your, your spokesperson here. And so God said, okay, fine, you don't have to do that. Because God is making a point for the Israelites, and Ezekiel points out to him, if I do that, then I'm going to be defiled. 
when the prophets have said back to God, you know, don't do that because there's a good person in the city or whatever. Right. Why is it that God hasn't thought through what he would be doing to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's, he's our God, and then he just yeah. so easily says, oh, okay. Well, he does it easily. Is, he, he, no, it, it, it takes some effort. Uh, there's, I don't understand. there's not a perfect answer for that. The best, the, the best suggestion is that that's God's way of making us think about it. Okay. That God is forcing us. For instance, when he says to Moses, I'm going to destroy the city of Solomon. Every person in it, they're all going to be destroyed. I, I sort of get this image of God going, what do you think of that, Moses? Everybody dead? What do you think? And Moses goes, no, wait a minute. What if there were 40 people who were righteous? And God goes, okay, for 40 people, I would save the city. Is that all you got? Well, what about 30? You know what? I think that in many cases it's because, and, and there's a mystery here. We don't know. You know, we, we don't know the mind of God fully. But I believe that the best explanation, and sometimes it seems fairly obvious when that happens, is because God is pushing us to, to respond, to think about it, to, to respond to what the you know what the proposal is, so that we're you know being sensitive to those things. Okay? Okay. Another, I think the thing that touches my heart about that is you just see the mercy of God. Yeah. He's like, but God, I'll define myself. He said, well, okay, you know. Yeah. You know <laughs> and it's, but maybe that's not the best. But you look through and you see God's mercy just displayed over and over and over, so yeah. much more powerful than what we can imagine. Exactly, and and always in circumstances where judgment would be very justified, you know, very much called for. So, okay. Just a second for it. I got a couple of people. Yes, go ahead. The, uh, you were saying saying earlier that you didn't know the origin of why uh, Israel was called Palestine. Mm -hmm. Romans, after the diaspora, decided to eradicate the Jewish identity of the land mm -hmm. by, by insulting the Jews by naming it Palestine. Okay. And after the Philistines. Yeah. To insult them. I know it was in the wrong time, time, but I didn't know the reason. That's good. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. I always think that when somebody point something out to God that God is you know he's pretty smart and he's saying <laughs> he's pretty smart. Yeah, he's, he's saying to us, see what happens when you get angry. Yeah. You say and do things in extreme that you don't really mean. Yeah. And so sit back and listen because I'm speaking to you always. Yeah. And others are speaking to you who are just a little bit calmer and they say a little bit of punishment goes a long way. Yeah. So yeah, we'll save so many people or we'll right. not well, make you do that. Sometimes it's actually, you know, God says something, and, and uh, I think the best example of that is that when the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai have put up the golden calf and they're worshiping it, God tells Moses, who's up on the mountain with him, that these people have, you know, committed idolatry again, I'm tired of it. I'm going to destroy them, Moses, and we'll start all over again. You and me, I'll give you a whole new people, and we'll... I think the reason God does that is because God, in effect, is saying to Moses, um, this people are going to continue to be a problem. This is not going to be easy. It's going to be bad all the way along. Are you sure you want to lead these people? And he does it by, by pushing the extreme and getting Moses to react to, what if I just wipe them out? In order for Moses to sort of have to say, oh, do I want to start? No, these are my people too. And God, you don't want to do that because people think you just dropped, took them out here in the desert and killed them all. So no, let's, and I believe that's God's way of getting Moses to acknowledge how, how big a, a thing he's biting off here. And yet to commit himself and absolutely lock his, his will and to say, yes, I'm going to do this, Lord. Let's not destroy them. Let, you know, let's move forward. Um, okay, let me keep going. I've got hours and hours and hours of this stuff. Um, uh, now, we get to a section here, uh, which I've called the end has come, the day of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, the day of the, we think of the day of the Lord as being perhaps a positive thing, you know, when the Lord returns. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament language was a day of judgment. It was a day of wrath. And so here, we have a presentation in chapter 6 and 7 of the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment. First, we have um, 
Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the mountains of Israel and tell the mountains that the high places and altars, the pagan altars that have been set up, are going to be smashed, that all of the cities are going to be laid waste. Um, but again, there's teasers in here about the fact that the people will be offered an opportunity to repent. And then we come to these passages where you get the intensity of God's, God's judgment. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to the land of Israel. The end. Exclamation point. <laughs> the end has come upon the four corners of the land. The end is now upon you, and I will unleash my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will surely repay you for your conduct and for the detestable practices among you. And here are both of those statements I mentioned. Then you will know that I am the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Disaster, unheard of disaster. See, it comes. The end has come. The end has come. It has roused itself against you. See, it comes. Doom has come upon you, upon you who dwell in the land. The time has come. The day is near. There is panic, not joy, on the mountains. I am about to pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will repay you for your conduct and for the detestable practices among you. Then you will know that it is I, the Lord, there it is, who strikes you. The day of the Lord, the day of judgment. The end has come. The end has come. God's judgment is at the door. Okay? Now, from here... Chapter 8, God gives Ezekiel a vision of the Jerusalem and the temple when he talks about the detestable practices. He literally, um, or not literally, he spiritually picks up Ezekiel and takes him to Jerusalem, into the temple. And in the temple, first Ezekiel sees what's called an idol of jealousy, which we believe would represent a, uh, an Asherah pole. Asherah was the, the wife you know, uh, of the god Baal. The, the primary god of the Canaanites. So there is an Asherah pole set up right in the middle of the temple courts, a pagan um, worship uh, place. Then Ezekiel sees 70 elders on the temple grounds who are practicing idolatry. He then sees a group of women in the inner courts, uh, the women's court, who are weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a Mesopotamian agriculture god sort of along the line of the corn gods that had existed in other places. The idea was that he would die every fall and then be reborn in the spring. Tammuz was the uh, husband of the goddess Ishtar. You've heard of Ishtar. And Babylon had a giant gate, an Ishtar gate, which there's actually replicas of now. So this Tammuz, the agricultural god, the, the corn god, if you will, I don't think they had corn there. Maybe that's a Mesoamerican thing. But that they were weeping this fall, they were weeping over the death of this foreign pagan god in the temple courts. And then finally, Ezekiel goes in and he sees a large group of men who are facing away from the sanctuary of the temple and are worshiping the sun. Now, there's several things to that. One is they're worshiping the sun. <laughs> the other thing is they have turned their backs on the temple of God, literally turned their back on God. This whole expression we get, turning your back on someone, meaning to reject them, that's a biblical idea. The idea. You didn't turn your back, literally, to anyone because that was rejection. And God talks about, uses the expression in the prophets, you have turned your back to me. Um, so this is the detestable practices that he's talking about. They are worshiping foreign gods, the sun, Tammuz, Asherah, um, right in the temple. And Ezekiel's given a vision of this. And this is why the judgment is coming. Now, in chapter 9, God summons, because of all of this, God summons six executioners and a scribe to come and carry out his judgment in Jerusalem. Again, these are things that Ezekiel is seeing in a vision. First, uh, God says that all of those who are loyal or repentant, all of those that have followed him will be marked for protection, and everyone else in the temple who is doing these detestable things is to be killed without mercy by these six executioners that he's called. In fact, um, Ezekiel 9.7 says, Fill the temple courts with corpses. The 
the severity of that judgment. Chapters 10 and 11 then has a presentation of the fact that the glory of God leaves the temple of Jerusalem before its destruction. Remember, the temple was where God lived. Literally, that was God's place of residence on earth in the midst of his people, in the middle of the city of David, Jerusalem. And in chapters 10 and 11, Ezekiel sees that the glory of God, the presence of God, literally rises up and departs from the temple. And the temple is no more the residence of God, and in preparation for its destruction. We then have another symbolic event where Ezekiel is told to go into exile in chapter 12. It reads, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. Therefore, Son of man, pack your belongings for exile. Now, he's already in exile. He's not in Jerusalem. He's in exile in Babylon. Uh, or outside Babylon, in Babylonia. Babylon was the city. Babylonia was the empire. Pack your belongings for exile, and in the daytime, as they watch, set out and go from the place where you are to another place. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious people. During the daytime, while they watch, bring out your belongings, pack for exile. Then in the evening, while they are watching, go out like those who go into exile. Now this is leading up to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which has not yet been destroyed. Uh, then, uh, do, do, do. while they watch, dig through the wall and take your belongings out through it. Put them on your shoulder as they are watching and carry them out of dust. Cover your face so that they cannot see the land, for I have made you a sign to the Israelites. So I did as I was commanded. During the day I brought out my things packed for exile. Then in the evening I dug through the wall with my hands. I took my belongings out at dusk and carried them on my shoulders while they watched. In the morning the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, did not the Israelites, that rebellious people, ask you, what are you doing? <coughs> Say to them, that is, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. There it is again. The prophecy concerning the prince in Jerusalem and all the Israelites who are there. Say to them, I am assigned to you. As I have done, so it will be done to them, the people in Jerusalem. They will go into exile as captives. <coughs> so another piece of theater that God has instructed Ezekiel to, to make clear to the people who are in exile, who... All this time, you, you've got to be sure that they were expecting, okay, if Jerusalem can stand, if Jerusalem can hold out, then maybe Nebuchadnezzar will fail, the Egyptians will rise, we'll get to go back home. There was always that hope. And part of what Ezekiel's job was is to make it clear that there's not hope. And the reason there's not hope is, is because of the way you all have acted and the way the people in Jerusalem are still acting. And so he has these pieces of theater to communicate that no, there isn't hope. Jerusalem will not stand. They, the people there will go in exile just like you were taken in exile. Chapter 13, God denounces the false prophets and he talks about the fact that they are uh, covered in whitewash like whitewash on a rotten wall that will be torn down. Chapter 14, idolatry is denounced, both the false prophets and the people who commit idolatry. But again, there's the promise that a small remnant will be saved. Chapter 15 and 16, we have the judgment on Israel. The first part of that judgment, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I'm taking too long, is Jerusalem is described as a useless vine, like a grapevine that has been burned on each end and charred. What good is it? You know, it should be just thrown away. And that's the way the Israelites, uh, the nation of Judah and Jerusalem are because they have been unfaithful. So I'm going to skip over that and talk about the adulterous wife. This theme or image of... Israel as an adulterous wife or a prostitute. We're going to talk about this a lot in Hosea because that's the whole theme of the book of Hosea. Where Hosea is told to marry a prostitute named Gomer as a sign of the unfaithfulness of the Israelites. But here, let me read you this passage. And I've actually got several slides, but it is so powerful. And I'm, I'm, I have to edit this because there's too much stuff. I mean, there's too much stuff I've got. And there's a lot more than this, but you'll get the idea. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. I clothed you, he starts out here by the way, and he says, you were born as an illegitimate child of two Canaanite peoples. And you were thrown out. They didn't even cut your cord. They threw you out and you were wallowing in your own blood. And I came and found you and protected you and took care of you and raised you up so that you could survive. Okay? So from the, it's like from the point of birth, God is saying to the people of Israel, I'm the one who who took care of you, who saved you from, going, from, from dying at the very start. Okay, He goes on. 
I clothed you in an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck, and I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was honey, olive oil, and the finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen, and your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. He's describing what he did for the people of Israel. And particularly under King David and King Solomon, the glory and the renown of the nation of Israel. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered your children and sacrificed them to the idols. Child sacrifice became part of what Israel the whole of Israel was responsible for. I am filled with fury against you, declares the Sovereign Lord, when you do these things acting like a brazen prostitute. Now, all the ellipses I have in here, and you'll notice I've, I've had to cut big sections of this. If you haven't read this, go back and read it. It is both horrid and lurid. It's about as lurid as anything you're ever going to read in Scripture. Very blunt language. Um, and, and I didn't, I didn't edit it for censorship. I just edited it to try to get the main point up here. Therefore, you prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you poured out your lust and exposed your naked body in your promiscuity with your lovers, and because all of your detestable idols, because you gave them your children's blood. So, you know, promiscuity, idolatry, um, sacrificing your children. Therefore, I'm going to gather all your lovers. These are the nations, and I actually list the nations that Israel has prostituted itself to. Uh, I'm going to gather all your lovers. I will gather them against you from all around and will strip you in front of them, and they will see you stark naked. I will sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery and who shed blood. I will bring on you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous <coughs> anger. Then I will deliver you into the hands of your lovers, and they will strip you of your clothes and take your fine jewelry and leave you stark naked. They will, they will bring a mob against you who will stone you and hack you to pieces with their swords. They will burn down your houses and inflict punishment on you in the sight of many women. I will put a stop to your prostitution and you will no longer pay your lovers. At one point it says that you, you do this not for pay like most prostitutes, but only because you're so lascivious. Okay. You, you actually pay your lovers when you prostitute yourself. Then my wrath against you will subside and my, my jealous anger will turn away from you. I will be calm and no longer angry. That little bit of of uh, glimmer of redemption. And then, the last part of this, where there's hope for restoration, that God will actually himself atone for the sins of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will deal with you as you deserve because you have despised my oath by breaking the covenant. Yet, I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. We're, we're here an echo here of what Jeremiah was told. You know, the future covenant which will be written on your hearts. You hear that here. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both those who are older than you and those who are younger. I will give them to you as daughters and not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I will establish my covenant with you and you will know that I am Lord. Then, listen to this, when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember to be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of humiliation, declares the Sovereign Lord. God will make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the Messianic expectation, the suffering servant of Isaiah, uh, the promise that the covenant will be renewed even though Israel is not worthy. Right? One more thing and then we'll take a break. Um, chapter 17, there's another very visual image of two eagles and two vines. The eagles are Babylon and Egypt. The vines are the captives who left or were taken off into captivity with uh, King Jehoiakim in 597. And the second vine is Jedekiah, um, or Zedekiah, I'm sorry, the weak king. 
the first vine is taken off by the first eagle, Babylon, and the second vine, Zedekiah, turned to the second eagle for protection, that is Egypt, and was denied, and so Zedekiah was defeated, blinded, and taken captive. Okay? Let's take a break for a few minutes. I'm going to move pretty quickly. I'm going to skip over a couple things because I've got too much stuff here. This is a... There's so much in Ezekiel, you know, uh, 48 chapters are really good stuff. Um, well, not of it good, but, <laughs> but interesting. Uh, I do want to say that one of the things that was happening in this time is that the people of uh, Judah, in fact, this would have been true for the Israelites in general, they thought that they were being punished because they were Israelites, because they were Jews, and that judgment was coming against the nation, and they just happened to be part of that nation. Like, it wasn't really their fault. It's because of who their fathers were. Um, but that they didn't have any personal responsibility for it. And so Ezekiel, by God's, again, when I say Ezekiel says, it's because God instructed him to. Ezekiel makes a big point of affirming individual responsibility. That the judgment is not against the whole nation. Well, it is against the nation. It's against, because the nation is made up of individual people who collectively have almost, almost every one rejected God. So this idea of individual responsibility is you're judged for your own actions now as well as in the future, not because of something somebody else did. And oh, I just went the wrong way. Um, so in Ezekiel 18, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? This was a Hebrew proverb. The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Stop it. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. This is an issue that Jesus... Uh, responds to over 500 years later when he says, did this man sin who's, who was born blind or was his parents? And Jesus said, neither one. You guys don't get it. Well, that was dealt with almost 600 years earlier here. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? So, everybody is to be judged for their own actions. You're responsible for yourself, not for your children, not for your parents, not for the nation you're part of. The reason that the nation of Israel was being judged is they, as, as a nation made up of individuals, had all agreed. If you go back to Mount Sinai, when Moses came down and says, this is the arrangement that God wants to have with you, and it says, and every one of them said, yes, we will do that. We will enter into the covenant with God. And so the judgment was against them as a nation because they were made up of individuals, all of whom had turned away from God. Um, we get then in chapters 19 and 20 a lament for the poor leaders in Judah and a recognition of the fact that Israel has always been whiny about this stuff and has always been unfaithful about things. Um, chapter 21, we're told the people didn't like what Ezekiel was saying and so they said, oh, well, he's only speaking in parables. It doesn't literally mean that all of this is going to come true. So Ezekiel says, uh-uh, it's all going to come true. And he gives three oracles to get the people's attention and straighten out their understanding in chapter 22, he says that Israel is a nation of bloodshed, that Israel is a nation of dross. Dross is the, the, the waste material when you, when you refine metal, silver, or whatever. Dross is the, the impurities that flow to the surface and have to be scraped off or get done away with. And you're a nation of uncleanness. Uncleanness is a huge thing to the Jewish people. And so you're a nation of bloodshed, of dross, of uncleanness. Chapter 23, we have this interesting little thing about the two sisters. Um, uh, Ohola, who represents Samaria, the capital city of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, and Oholiba, representing Jerusalem, the capital city of the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, Ezekiel says that Ohola sinned against God, prostituted herself, and was destroyed for it by the Assyrians, 
And Aholibah, her younger sister, learned absolutely nothing from that and is going to go down the same road and be destroyed in the same way. Chapter 24 is actually where um, is the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. Um, this is the siege of Jerusalem started in 588. The city was destroyed in 586. And Elijah describes Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Elijah. Ezekiel describes the city of Jerusalem like a rusty pot that has been contaminated and that God will discard the contamination, the city of Jerusalem. And in chapter 24, Ezekiel's wife dies as a, a real-life illustration of the death of Jerusalem. <coughs> And God says to Ezekiel, do not publicly mourn your wife. Mourn her inside, but do not publicly mourn her. And the people, the exiles where Ezekiel's living asked, why aren't you mourning your wife? And he said, you know, God told me, this is a symbol of the fact that the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great king, has been destroyed. Okay? Then we get to the uh, oracle against the nations, and I'm going to go through that quickly. This map, which you cannot see from back there, um, this is the land of Canaan. Actually, this was during Joshua's time, but it's got, it's got the names on it I wanted. You'll notice here the Ammonite. Th this would be Israel. This is um, the, the land of the Jebusites. Jerusalem was right here. Okay, um, So this would have been Israel. This is where the Ammonites lived, on the east side of the River Jordan. This is where the Moabites live, east of the Dead Sea. Down here are the Edomites. Now, the Ammonites and Moabites were both descendants of Lot. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Over here, you've got, uh, oh, where is it? The Philistines, right along the coast. And then up here, this uh, you'll notice the city of Tyre is right there. And it says Sidonians. The city of Sidon is up here. All of them, and then Egypt is down here. Okay? All of those, Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites, Philistines, the city of Tyre, and Egypt are all nations. And Tyre is a city, but it was a city nation, a city state that was very significant. Uh, all of them are prophesied against. And I'm not going to read all of this, but the highlights... Um, Ezekiel 25 starts out with a declaration of judgment against the Ammonites and the, the nation of Ammon, and then the Moabites, then the Edomites, and then the Philistines. All of them, this, this oracle against the nations, and you can go back and read this because all these slides are online, or you could just read chapter 25. Mm -hmm. um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all have oracles against the nations, and they continue with oracles against the city of Tyre, against Sidon, the city of Sidon, and then against Egypt. And Egypt is actually more than two chapters of judgment against Egypt and against the Pharaoh. There's a lot of content in there about all God is going to do against in judgment against Egypt. Um, I would mention that the city of Tyre is very interesting. Tyre was a city-state, and at one point they were the dominant uh, maritime power in the known world. I mean, the whole Mediterranean, the Mediterranean was all the seagoing peoples there were. Um, they created a colonial empire. They, uh, they populated what became known as the city of Carthage in North Africa. And they had a huge navy. They were both uh, militarily and as well as merchant, from a merchant perspective. And the city of Tyre was interesting because there was a city on the coast and then quite a ways off the coast, like uh, I think it was three kilometers or something, there was an, an island that had a fortified city on that. No one had ever succeeded in conquering Tyre because of that fortified island city, part of the city. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar um, besieged the city for 12 years and didn't conquer it. It was not conquered until Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquers all of Asia Minor, defeats the Persian Empire, is coming down the coast, he comes to Tyre, Tyre refuses to surrender. Why surrender? They've never been defeated. So what Alexander the Great, who, did, who was known for not thinking small, he completely destroyed the coastline city, the city that was on the mainland, turned it into rubble, dumped the rubble into the sea, and made a causeway that reached all the way out to the island city between two and three hundred yards wide. Wow. And then, so that he could assault it by land, and then he marched down the coast and conquered another country's navy. And so now he had a navy. And he brought the navy up there, and he defeated Tyre, and, and ended up killing a huge number of people, and I think 30,000 people were sold into slavery because they refused to surrender to him. Okay. 
Alexander did not like taking no for an answer. So, anyway, so it's a fascinating place, and it's a fascinating story about the kingdom, all right? Um, then we get the renewal of the call to Ezekiel. Now, from chapters 33 to 39, we get into the promised renewal and restoration of Israel. And that starts out with the call to um, Ezekiel to renew his responsibility. In fact, watchmen, you'll notice there, son of man, I've made you a watchman. Watchman is one of the word we translate watchman was interchangeable with the word we translate as prophet. Prophets were considered the watchman. A watchman is somebody who's supposed to stay on the walls and keep an eye out and let you know if the, if the enemy was coming. Okay, and so that was his job. It's interesting, and this is scary for anybody involved in ministry, uh, starting here in verse 8. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you, meaning Ezekiel, the watchman, the pastor, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. Mm -hmm. This is why the New Testament says those who presume to teach will be judged more harshly. Okay? A very serious kind of thing. And yet he goes on to say, and yet if you do warn them and they still um, do not turn and die in their sins, you won't be held accountable for that. Okay? Uh, which is good. <laughs> so, but in, in the midst of this promise of restoration, there's a huge call to repentance. You'll notice, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Which he said earlier as well. We then get, in the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month of the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has fallen. Hope is gone. The city is gone. It's been destroyed. Um, and there is the declaration that because of the sin, you know, down here it says, uh, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. He explains why Jerusalem fell. He says, since you eat meat with blood still in it, which was part of the law, you know, you're not allowed to eat meat with blood still in it, which some people interpret as saying, eat meat that's still alive. You know, I, I told you before, one of the things they used to do is they would take an animal and hang it up and cut off one leg at a time and eat it, and the animal was still alive, so the meat didn't rot. That was considered a sin. Okay? Duh. Um, well, as, it, as well it should be. So the idea was, and that's why to make sure they didn't violate that law, um, kosher restrictions required that all of the blood be drained out of an animal. Okay? Um, you eat meat with blood still in it. You look to your idols and shed blood. Should you possess the land? What right do you have to think that Jerusalem shouldn't be destroyed? That you should still be in the promised land? You rely on your sword. You do detestable things. Each of you defiles your neighbor's wife, which means sexual promiscuity. <laughs> should you possess the land? Really? You really think that? Come on, people. And then, chapter 34 identifies judgment against Israel's spiritual leaders. The, those who are called the shepherds. And God himself agrees to step in. And this is a beautiful passage. Uh, Ezekiel 34, starting with verse 10. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. He means the spiritual leaders. I will rescue my flock from their mouths. I will, and it will no longer be food for them. The religious leaders are described as only taking care of the people so that they get benefit out of it. I myself, God says will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. Remember, return from exile is the definition of salvation to the Jews. And that's what God is describing here. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. God himself promises to bring his people back from exile and to directly himself be their shepherd. You read in Revelation um, 20, the idea of God will be our God and we will be his people and we will live with him and he will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no, no more suffering or grief or death. That's 
the New Testament description of the same thing here. Rich? That's what the Jews felt in 1947. Well, exactly. The idea of return, the, that the reason why 1947, 1948 is so important in Jewish history is they saw that as the beginning of the fulfillment of these prophecies. And not just here, but throughout a lot, of, there are a lot of different places that refers to that. Joanne? That was the same question. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, there's one last thing I want to do with uh, Ezekiel. Again, if you keep reading the, the last, uh, from 43 to 48, you get into the, uh, or 40 to 48, the description of the new temple. Very sort of uh, visionary, kind of prophetic, but and very challenging to interpret. In fact, Ezekiel 40 to 48 may be the most difficult nine chapters to interpret in the whole Bible. Okay, I'll just warn you. Uh, but interesting nonetheless. I do want to give you the Valley of Dry Oh, that one I saw. The Valley of Dry Bones. Are you all familiar with the Valley of Dry Bones? It's a vivid picture. Again, this is the section where, where God is speaking through Ezekiel to say there will be restoration. There will be new life. Things will be made alive again. So, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gives the perfect answer, the perfect diplomatic answer if God asks you a question. I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. How many times have you heard that expression? <laughs> Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. That's the reaction to the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Return from exile. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. There it is, the Lord has spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. The valley of dry bones. The giving back of life to those who are dead. Okay? Chapter 38 is a completely mysterious passage about Gog and Magog. And no one knows what that means. And you will hear people tell you they know what it means, but they don't. Um, it is, we don't, there was, people think that those were two regions of Anatolia, what we know as Turkey, Asia Minor, um, that we do know they represent the enemies of God's people, and Gog and Magog call together a seven-nation coalition that attacks Israel, or the people of God, uh, there's a worldwide alliance, it, Gog and Magog are referred to again in Revelation 20, you see the, the the similarities between Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelation, there's a lot of cross-reference there. Some people interpret this as the start of the Great Tribulation, but we really don't know. We just know that it, it's talking about a future uh, coalition of some nations that will oppose the people of God. Okay? Questions about any of that? There's a lot of mystery here at the end. I mean, from, from chapter 38 to 48, there's more question marks than there are answers in terms of people's knowledge. Someday, we will know. That's all we can say, all right? Um, Daniel. i got 25 minutes to tell you about Daniel. Um, these are some images of Daniel. Here, Daniel in the lion's den, many, many paintings of that. In fact, the book of Daniel is, is a fascinating one. 
Daniel is probably the most disputed and the most debated of all Bible books because people question when it was written, who wrote it, whether history is accurate, everything about it is questioned. Is it a prophetic book? We list it in the prophets. Uh, the, the Christian Bible lists it as one of the major prophets. The Jewish Bible lists it under wisdom writings. They don't call it a prophetic book. It's considered apocalyptic. Uh, apocalyptic writings are writings that include visions and symbols and mysteries, usually involve a heavenly interpreter that's necessary for understanding. Usually it involves predictive prophecy, telling the future. Remember, prophecy doesn't inherently mean telling the future. Prophecy means to speak for God. But predictive prophecy is what we call it when it does include talking about something that's yet to come. Or is it history? Because it's talking about a historical time, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it, it's a very, in some ways, confusing to know how to start interpreting this book. And that's why it's questioned. Here we have Daniel the lion's den. Here we have Daniel um, interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's first dream, the dream of the giant image that was made out of gold, silver, iron, and clay. Um, here, this is the Sistine Chapel's representation of Daniel. If you could see it, it actually has a nameplate there. It says Daniel. This is Daniel as an older man praying, the thing that got him in trouble in the Persian, uh, where he got the thing that, that caused him to be thrown into the Nimrods. Okay, was that he refused, he continued to pray to his God when an edict was uh, published that says that people could only pray to the Persian king. This? Question? Okay. Um, again, here, overlap in dates. Um, the, there were kings, most of it takes place during Nebuchadnezzar, but there were some, still some kings in Judah. Uh, it is prophecy about Israel and the Gentile nations, and it's to the Jews in Babylon and the Gentile kings. Okay? Uh, but it's, it covers a lot of different things, especially the last half. It's, you can think of Daniel as being in two parts. Again, Daniel and Ezekiel, right in this in-between period after Judah falls, and uh, before the reestablishment of the um, temple in the city of, Ju uh, of Jerusalem, and it's under the Babylonian control. We've already looked at that one, you can see. All right, let's talk about a couple of the features of the book. One, um, the, the, you can think of this book in two parts. The first six chapters, it's 12 chapters, the first six chapters are stories. Um, let's put all this up here are stories about Daniel and his friends in Babylon and interpreting the in Babylon and in Persia, interpreting dreams and how God is, is still with them and working with them. The second half, chapter 7 to 12, is entirely visions that Daniel has later on in his life, very personal accounts that Daniel is sharing. Um, there are some very unusual kind of pieces in here. Like I say, there's so much controversy. Carolyn was asking me at the break. Um, I'm sure you all read this in advance of class, which you were assigned to do. Um, chapter 4 is written by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, it is I, Nebuchadnezzar, and he gives a testimony of what happened to him. And we, we've, and the you know, liberal scholars would say absolutely not, but traditional scholars would say, yeah, apparently that Nebuchadnezzar gives his witness. Nebuchadnezzar came to a belief in, in the one true God, Yahweh, <coughs> through this whole process. Now, you'll notice that this book is unusual in another way, and that it is, it is not all written in Hebrew. Um, part of it is written in Hebrew, part of it is written in Chaldean, or the Babylonian language, which is also known as Aramaic. This was the common street language in Jesus' time, or Aramaic or Chaldean. The reason was, where had the um, Israelites been before they came back to Jerusalem? <coughs> Babylon. And so they were there for 70 years. They learned to speak the local language. If you took Americans or Canadians and dropped them in the middle of Mexico, and you went 70 years so that you're into the third generation or so, they'd be speaking Spanish. The same thing was true. That's why Aramaic was common. This book, the first part of it, the, uh, chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2, and then the last half of it are written in Hebrew, and the in-between sections are written in Chaldean, Aramaic. Um, again, is it apocalyptic? Is it prophetic? Is it historic? It, it's interesting that it is built on a, a very particular structure, which is called a double chiasm. A chiasm, the way to think about that is like a wave. A chiasm is a writing style where you build a story out and then you build it back again. So this historical prologue, and, and you get the various elements, by the way, this light blue, which is hard to tell, and this is all in Hebrew, 
This section is all in Chaldean or Aramaic. And there are sort of parallel stories that build the story out and then back again, and then build the story out and back again. One way to see that is this slide, the um, image of the four kingdoms, okay? You have the, the dream of the, oh, sorry, one button too many. Uh, the dream of the image of the four kingdoms, and then you have the rescue of Daniel's friends from the fiery furnace, then Nebuchadnezzar's dream, his humiliation, Belshazzar's handwriting on the wall, Belshazzar's humiliation and death, then the rescue of Daniel from the, the lion's den, which parallels the, his, his friends in the fiery furnace, and then the vision of the four beasts, which parallels the four kingdoms. So it's a story that builds out and then builds back again with parallel stories. Uh, a very intentional kind of uh, formal literary structure. One of the... Well, let's, let's look at this passage, which is how they got started. How did Daniel and his friends end up dealing with all these situations in Babylon? This is from the first verses of the first chapter. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. This besieging was like camp out there until I opened the door. It did not involve destroying the city at that point. This is the first of the assaults. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. That will come up later. Okay, the, the articles from the temple in Jerusalem. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So we continue to refer to Daniel by his Hebrew name, Daniel, instead of his uh, Chaldean name, Belteshazzar. But we have, custom we have fallen into the habit of referring to his three friends by their Chaldean name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or as Carolyn was called as a child, I always have to say this. Shake a bed, shake a bed, make a bed, and to bed we go. Um, so that's how they end up there. Now the rest of chapter one is when Daniel gets, they don't want to eat the, the royal food, either because it wasn't kosher or because it would have been sacrificed to Babylonian gods before it got to the king's table. And so the chief, uh, the, the, the chief officer responsible for feeding them and taking care of them said, look, if you guys get sick and skinny, then it's my head. And Daniel said, tell you what, let us go for a period of time just drinking water and eating vegetables and see who's healthier. And so they eat vegetables and drink water. They don't eat the meats and the stuff on the table. And they end up being healthier and looking better than the other guys. And so they agree to let them eat what they want. So that was the first way in which Daniel and his friends clearly established that they are going to continue to follow the God of Israel. They are not going to fall into all of the expectations and temptations that um, occur in Babylon. Okay? Now, you compare that to the fact that most of the Israelites, while they were still in Israel, while they still had the temple, living in Jerusalem, worshipped foreign gods. Well, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and some of the others continued to worship the one true God, even when everything around them would have forced them, would, you would think, would have forced them to go in that direction. All right, chapter 2, I'm not going to read this, I want to give you a quick summary. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he calls his... Magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers in, and he says, okay, I just had a dream, and it bothered me. Tell me what it means. And they go, great, we'll tell you, king. Tell us what the dream was. He goes, uh, no, you're supposed to be magicians and sorcerers and, you know, enchanters. You tell me what the dream is, and then tell me what it means. And they went, we can't do that. We can do that. He says, I'll tell you what, unless you tell me what my dream is, and then tell me what it means, I am going to have you cut into pieces and have your houses torn down and turned into rubble. And your families too. Okay? <laughs> and they go, nobody can do that. And he says, okay. He sends orders out to kill all of the wise men in Babylon. Wow. 
So one of the lieutenants go to, um, actually, get ahead here. One of the lieutenants goes out to um, the Daniel and his friends, since they were part of the royal court, they were considered part of the wise men, and they're going to get killed too. Well, Daniel says, whoa, 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 whoa. Give, give me overnight and see what we can do. And so he goes to his friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Hananiah, you know, Mishael, etc., and says, pray tonight that I'll have an understanding of what this dream was. They pray all night. The next morning, Daniel knows what the dream is. And so he sends word, let me speak to the king. And he goes in to see the king and says, I can tell you what your dream was. And he tells uh, Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. And then he tells him what it means. What the dream was, which I'll start at verse 31 here. Your majesty looked. This is Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue at its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. You've heard the expression, he had feet of clay, meaning you know, he, he didn't hold up. That's where it comes from, feet of clay. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain. The rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. And by the way, as he came in to tell the king, the king said, can you interpret my dream for me? And Daniel said, there is no person who can interpret your dream, but I serve a God who can interpret your dream. Every time something like this comes up, Daniel gives credit to God. He does not take credit for himself. Well, Daniel then interprets the dream and says each of those pieces of that idol that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of represented a different kingdom. The gold was the kingdom of Babylon that was currently in, in ruling everything, and it represented by Nebuchadnezzar. The silver would be the next kingdom, which we attach these responsive, these uh, labels, we believe would have been the Persians. The bronze would have been the Greeks who came next. And then the iron would have been either the Romans or the Seleucids. Um, the, the Greeks, that is the bronze part, that's Alexander the Great. And so when Alexander the Great died without any heirs, the, the world was, the empire, which was most of the known world, was broken up under his generals. And so the iron part is either believed to be the uh, his generals that were responsible for the empire at that point, or it's the Romans. People differ on that. Later on in Daniel 7, we have another four-part vision, the vision of the beasts. And so, vision of the great statue, vision of the beasts, Daniel 7, Daniel 2. These are kings and kingdoms. The head of fine gold, the lion with wings, is believed to be Babylon. The breast of, and arms of silver, the bear with three ribs in his teeth, is believed to be the Medes and the Persians. The, uh, the Medes were a in the Persians, they worked together. It was two different kingdoms, but they're considered one in terms of their conquering. Um, the belly and thighs of bronze, or the leopard with four wings and four heads, is believed to be Greece. The legs of iron and clay with ten toes. The beast with iron teeth and ten horns is believed to be either Antiochus, the Seleucid, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, which was one of the descendants of the generals of uh, Alexander, or it's Rome. So these two parallels, that's part of that chiasm. Builds out and builds back. Those two visions are seen as being of the same thing. Then we have the wonderful story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, where Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden idol. He calls all of his people together, satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates. And they say that like five times. They keep repeating that long list of different officials. And they say that whenever... The, you hear the music of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and other kinds of music. You're to fall down and worship this image. Nebuchadnezzar says anybody who doesn't is going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, Daniel and his friends are so good at their work that all the other guys are always jealous of them. And they're always looking for some reason to get them in trouble. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't fall down and worship the, the golden idol because they're still worshiping the one true God. And so they get reported. And they come before Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar says, fall down and worship them. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, and this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. 
King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, that's the part I love. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar blows up. He's so mad. He orders the furnace heated seven times hotter. Orders Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tied up, and he sends soldiers, his strongest soldiers, to throw them in. In fact, the furnace is so hot, the guys who go to throw them in the fire themselves get killed. And after they're thrown in the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar looks and goes, wait a minute, didn't we throw three people in the fire? I see four people in the flames. And he gets scared. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. But in fact, what he says is, which I love, all right, he's just trying to execute them, and now he thinks they're still alive walking around in there. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Okay, uh, I think maybe I should change sides here. I'm going to be on your team, not the Golden Idol side. Come out. Come here. They come out. It says that the fire hadn't harmed their bodies. Not one hair of their head was singed. Their robes weren't scorched. They didn't smell of fire. And Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. And he goes on and gets a blessing to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? We then have in chapter 4, which is the part that's written by Nebuchadnezzar. It says, I am Nebuchadnezzar. And he shares this story. He had another vision of a tree that gets cut off. Daniel comes in and interprets it that the tree is the king. And the king, this giant tree, had provided cover for animals and birds and all kinds of things. But then it got cut off. And Daniel says, because you, you do not recognize the power and authority of the one true God, then you're in danger of being cut off, Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, Nebuchadnezzar, it says he's walking around the walls of a city, and he goes, Man, am I cool or what? Look at all that I have done. I am the king of the whole world. And because of that failure to recognize the power and sovereignty of God, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what uh, Daniel had prophesied, he is driven insane. He loses his mind. His hair grows out. His nails grow out. He eats grass like a cow. You know, it says, like cattle of the field. He, he's living in the wilderness, in, an insane man. Later on, God gives him the grace to allow him to get enough of his right mind to recognize the sovereignty and power of God. He is given his sanity back, and he retakes his authority as the king. And in that, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 testifies to the truth of the one true God, Yahweh. Okay? Um, great story. Then we have the handwriting on the wall. Now, all of these things, handwriting on the wall, Daniel in the lion's den... There's so many things out of Daniel that these not only become popular stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, but expressions like, oh, well, you know, he saw the handwriting on the wall. You've heard that expression? This is where it comes from. King Belshazzar, now not to be confused with Belteshazzar, which is what Daniel's Chaldean name is, he is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, this is one of those cases where liberal scholars had said, well, he was never king. And because he's not in the official records, then later on they found documentation that he actually was co-regent with his father. And so he was king. And while his father's out of town, he's in charge. So he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But the liberal scholars were proven wrong. The conservative scholars who said, it says king, we take that, were proven correct. And in my experience, quite often, the more they learn, the more we figure out that the conservative interpretations are more accurate. Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave order to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, which were intended only for the worship of God. So that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that were taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. <clears throat> Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. 
It goes on to say that they call in the wise men, nobody can interpret it, and then somebody remembers that Daniel, who's now quite up in years, he has ability to uh, interpret. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles, my father the king? Again, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was his grandfather, but they would refer to my father uh, frequently, even if it wasn't related. Whoever the predecessor was on the throne, he referred to as my father the king. Okay. Um, the king said to him, Are you Daniel? Da, da, da. I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you. Notice gods. He doesn't acknowledge the one true God. The spirit of the gods is in you, and you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I've heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple, which is a sign of royalty. Have a gold chain placed around your neck, you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That would be after uh, Belshazzar's father, and Belshazzar, and then it would have been Daniel. But Daniel, then Daniel answered the king, you may keep the gifts for yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will read the writing of the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave, uh, he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. That's chapter 4. He didn't come back until he acknowledged God. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is what... This is the inscription that was written. Many, many, tekel, parson. Here is what these words mean. Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Perez, which is a version of parson. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was <coughs> slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. <coughs> the Persians conquered Babylon and the Babylonian Empire virtually without shedding any blood, and it was almost literally overnight. Darius the Mede here is not a reference to King Darius, who comes later. Darius the First or Darius the Great uh, is a later king. Darius the Mede was either one of the generals or else is another name for Cyrus the Great, who was the king of Persia who was responsible for conquering Babylon. We then have the wonderful story of Daniel in the lion's den, which again takes place not under the Babylonians, but after the Persians have taken over. The idea is they insist a bunch of guys trick the Persian king um, into writing a declaration that only he can be prayed to for a certain period of time. Daniel is committed to God, and so Daniel prays three times a day. <coughs> the people who set this up, they do it on purpose in order to catch Daniel and get him in trouble when they report to the king that Daniel has been praying to his God instead of to the Persian king. Reluctantly, he doesn't want to do it, the king has... Daniel thrown into the lion's den. But he does so, but, and when he does, he says, So the king gave the order, they brought Daniel, threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. He didn't want to do this, but a, a, something we read here, and we also read in the book of e Esther, is the law was that once they wrote a, an edict, once the king of Persia wrote an edict, he couldn't withdraw it. It could not be undone, even by the king. That happens in, in Esther as well. So in this case, the king gives the order, Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, um, and then and they cover it with a stone. The next morning, after he hasn't slept all night, hasn't eaten anything, the king is so worried, he comes and runs up. At first light, it says, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? 
Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. They draw Daniel out and they throw the men who had falsely accused Daniel in and in, along with their wives and children. It was a harsh world. And before they reached the floor of the den, we're told the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Okay. And the last. In Daniel 7, along with the vision of the four beasts, which parallels the, the earlier vision he had of the pieces of the large statue that Nebuchadnezzar viewed, Daniel has a vision of the Son of Man. I'll finish with this. As I looked, thrones were set up. This is a vision now. And the Ancient of Days, which is my favorite name for God. The Ancient of Days is such a wonderful name for, for God. The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. So this is the throne and court of God Almighty in heaven. And Daniel goes on. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You wonder why Jesus called himself the Son of Man? Any Jew in the first century when Jesus was on earth who heard Son of Man, Daniel is one of the favorite books of the Old Testament. That's what they would have known. Now, Son of Man means a human being, and Jesus was a human being, but more than a human being. He was not Son of Man the way Ezekiel was referred to as the Son of Man. He was the Son of Man from the vision of Daniel. Given all authority, glory, and sovereign power, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And then chapters 8 through 12 of Daniel, we have various other visions that he has of the end of times, and he has conversations with the angel Gabriel, who refers to other angelic things that are going on. It's interesting stuff, but hard for us to understand. That's the book of Daniel. Any questions? I'm only five minutes late. Ezekiel and Daniel. If you have not read them yet, go back and do so. Hopefully now you'll have a little bit more perspective. There are sections that are very, very hard to understand, especially like the last nine chapters of Ezekiel uh, from 40 to 48. They're very hard to interpret. Daniel, as I say, there's a lot of questions in terms of understanding them. Uh, but certainly worth it, and certainly the message to us the, the blessing we have of hindsight as Christians to understand some of these things, if, if you know anything about the history, for instance, of the Seleucid empires, and you read in uh, Daniel some of the things about the, the kingdom being broken up into four, and then one, of the, one small horn off of one of the four, and you understand there were four generals under, under Alexander the Great that took over the empire, and then one junior general who was under another one rose, that was Seleucid, the Seleucid Empire. All of this stuff lines up in astonishing ways. Is right? that the bragging little horn? Was that yes. Was it's believed that that was Seleucid, who was not, he was not one of the generals who directly inherited. He was a junior general who later took over in authority and power from being a junior. Okay. You now know everything about Ezekiel and Daniel? You guys have a great week.